Dearly beloved, good afternoon. So happy to see so many of you here today. Are you happy today? <laughs> Not so sure even. Huh? Okay, uh, before I begin this uh, sermon, I want to ask you a question. And you answer me honestly. If you are a kind person, put up your hand. Okay, put it another way. Huh? If you have been treated uh, kindly lately, put up your hand. Oh, not bad. Okay, I'm quite safe. Today, I'm going to talk about kindness. Uh, that is why I ask you to or conduct a survey in order to know where, which direction we are going. But I want to ask you on this statement on kindness and see whether uh, you agree or not. First, an act of kindness will make the receiver a happy person. Yeah, just now you put up your hand, you say that, you know, uh, I have been uh, treated uh, kindly uh, just now, uh, lately. Yes? Okay, number two, we, we are kind, listen, we are kind because we appreciate kindness. Yes? No? Number three, true kindness doesn't expect return. For example, we do, we do not show kindness to accumulate so-called positive karma. Or we show kindness uh, in order to look good, right? All agree? Okay. Two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, during our retreat uh, in Malaysia, I was stranded outside a shopping mall. Because I did not have the touch and go card with me. So Elder Jonas and uh, Gregory's car, they entered uh, the shopping mall first. So when I arrived at the gantry, I realized that I have left my touch and go card in the hotel. So I have to reverse my car and think of a way to solve the problem. You know, I'm in Malaysia. But there is no way and I need help. So first, the security guard at the entrance offer a 15 minutes grace, which is not enough for me. My wife went into the mall and looked for Elder Jonas, who offers his touch and go card, and the problem was solved. What a relief. You see, in life, sometimes we run into trouble and we need help especially when we are in a foreign land. We need a kind soul to help us. Kindness is so precious, especially when we are in a desperate situation. A little kindness can make a world of difference. People in this world are getting more and more individualistic and self-centered. Sometimes we are discouraged by people who claim their rights not to be kind. And some who even think that kindness is an entitlement. Well, whatever the situations we are facing, the truth remain that this world will be a better place. I'm sure you agree with me if there are more kind people. Yes? But the question is, are you one of the kind soul to make the difference? That is why I ask you. Anyway, last Sunday, we learned from Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 15 to 25 about God's financial system. And we are exhorted to be generous to others because our God is a generous God who sacrificed even his son unconditionally to save our soul. Today, 
in Deuteronomy chapter 24, we will see our kind God directing us to be kind to others. So in the 22 verses, we will see how God show his kindness in giving us the law to protect our marriages and our lives, especially the poor and the vulnerable. So please, my dearly beloved, listen carefully and obey God's law readily and be a kind person for God's glory. So before we unpack the 22 verses, let us pray. Let us pray. Eh? Father in heaven, in your holy presence we pray that your word will transform our souls and fill us with your excellence, beauty, purity, and glory. Make us a kind person you intended in the likeness of Christ Jesus. In his holy name we ask and pray. Amen. Let us begin by looking at the law that protect marriage in verse 1 to 5. There are two parts of the law. The first part of the law in verse 1 to 4 demands that God's people are to take marriage seriously. And the second part in verse 5 demands that married couple must fulfill their duty. Now, verses 1 to 4, listen carefully, is the law that addresses the problem of frequent divorce and remarry. This law is not about when the married couples can or cannot divorce or who they can or cannot remarry. At that time, God allows the divorce, but he never commanded. it. Moses issued certificate of divorce. Jesus said it, that it was due to the hardness of heart. Now, in this hardened heart situation, a law is needed to discourage married couple from divorcing and remarrying. As we see in verse 1, the husband divorces his wife easily. When he finds his wife somewhat, some indecency or uncleanness, probably sexual immorality, and if he doesn't like it, he hands her a certificate of divorce. We don't know what is that indecency that offended the husband because it is not specified. But we know that the husband is not willing to forgive her. That is why he sent her away. Likewise, in verse 3, her second husband, instead of loving her, he hates her and divorced her. We don't know, once again, we don't know what and why he hates her, that he has to throw her out of the house. And lo and behold, she is making her way back to her first husband. And God prohibit her to marry her first husband again. Even if her second husband has died. Why? Because she is sexually polluted. And it is an abomination before the Lord. Look at verse 4. She has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. The holy God is displeased and disgusted with such sexual immorality. This law is to stop people from creating a culture of marrying, divorcing at their whims and fancy. God doesn't want the society to be dragged into moral 
decadence and pollute the land he is giving them. So dearly beloved, marriage is a sacred union between a man and a woman instituted by God for at least three purposes. Marriage is a reflection of our re sacred relationship with God. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that Christ is the husband and the church that is we all is his wife. Marriage is also for the procreation, in other words, reproducing of the image of God. And thirdly, marriage is for sexual enjoyment. The joy of sharing the holy union ordained by God. So, marriage is for God. It's for God's glory. It's for God's purity. So, you see in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says, let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be what? Be undefiled. For God will judge the sexual immoral and adulterous. We cannot be married or divorced casually. It had to be carefully thought out. Why? Because it was supposed to be permanent. In today's context, we have wives swap and couples exchanging partners to try out relationship, to experiment love through sex in the name of reviving their marriage. God forbid. Don't do that. It will mess up your life, your family, and the society. So if you want to get married, you must hold your marriage with high regards. Please, marry someone who is kind to you. Don't get married if you are not ready. The Bible never said everyone must get married. The Bible never said everyone, every married couple must have children. In fact, Paul, who is a, is a single, said single has the advantage of having more time, more energy to serve God. And be kind to your spouse and yourself. If you are married, stay faithful and kind to your spouse. Remember, breaking up is hurtful and life after breakup is painful. Finally, Cherish your second marriage. If you are in your second marriage, learn to love each other dearly and forgive each other readily. Cherish what you have and be thankful. The second part of the law calls us, calls the married couple to fulfill God's ordained duty. When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army, that means military service, or be liable for any other public duty. He shall be free at home one year to be happy with his wife. This was God's way of honoring and blessing the marriage covenant. God kindly allowed men who were newly married to be exempted from military duty or other state services for one year so that he can bring happiness to his wife and to himself. So in Singapore context, husband and wife, listen carefully, we must not sacrifice our marriage for our career or even ministry. Our marriage relationship must take priority. So, the spiritual principle for us is this. Couple, please take note. Couple must spend quality time 
to enrich and strengthen our marriage. Just like a newlywed couple, they need time together to really pay attention to their life partners and allow their relationship to take root. It is a sacred duty, listen. It is a sacred duty for both husband and wife. Remember, marriage is about God. Whether you have children or not, your relationship cannot survive without spending quality time with your spouse. By the way, staying at home watching TV is not quality time. And for the seniors among us, I included, when you retire from work, do not retire from your marriage. Be kind to yourself and to your spouse. Don't treat each other like stranger in the house. So in summary, married couple are to fulfill the marriage vow. Be there, be there for each other. Forgive as God has forgiven us. So don't go to another woman or man. And it should remind us also our marriage to Jesus Christ. Spend time to develop a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And don't get involved with idols. And let us thank God for his kindness by obeying his law and make our marriage strong and healthy. In the remaining verses of chapter 24, Moses gives a list of laws to instruct God's people to show kindness in public. From home now to the public, God knows that living in the promised land will not be easy. The Israelites must work hard to build their lives and to raise their family for God's glory. Some, some of them will be more successful than the other. And some will become poor and vulnerable in one way or another. Now, this law are set to alleviate the suffering of such people. So we can see that there are seven laws to show kindness to the poor and vulnerable people. The first law is to protect the livelihood of the poor who borrows. Verse number six, no one shall take a meal or an upper millstone in pledge. For that would be taking, taking a life in pledge. You see, the lender is the master to the borrower, right? He has the upper hand. As we see in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, it says, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave to the lender. However, the law forbids the lender to take away the tools the borrower needs for making food or for a living. Taking away their millstone, even just one part of it, is taking their life. So it is not kindness if we are willing to see the borrower die, isn't it? And in our context, this would be our spiritual principle. When we help people, when we lend money to people to help them, we must always think of their survival as well as salvation. John 3.16 is all we know very well that this is a message of salvation. So it is good that you use your money to help. It is even better if you also let them know, people who borrow money from you, that God loves them and a better life 
can be found in Jesus. That is kindness. The second law in verse 7, which is to stop the evil of kidnapping. If a man is found stealing one of his brothers of the people of Israel, and if he treats him as a slave, number one, or sell him, number two, then this thief, this kidnapper, shall die. So you shall, put, you shall purge the evil from your midst. Stealing human, treating them as slaves, and treating them like merchandise. We call such people kidnapper, right? Or human trafficker. Now this law demands that kidnapper must be put to death. Why? Because they are a threat to human life. In Singapore, do you know? Penalty for kidnapping is death. Or at least life imprisonment. Kidnappers are selfish people. They have no regard at all for other human beings. So the spiritual principle is this. That we must be mindful of the welfare of others. We cannot be selfish by benefiting ourselves. Why? Because any other people in our life are also made in the image of God. Sometimes we just conveniently forget because we are so self-centered. Uh, what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, let each of you, I mean every one of us, not only Look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. As Christians, we must be considerate for the people around us. For example, be kind to your neighbors. Avoid making loud noises. This one probably you can see in every HDB block notice board. Give up or give up your seats for the elderly, especially the young people in our midst. I want to say to you, please do that, and that will do you good. And don't block the passageway. You know what I mean? Don't be selfish and cruel. The third law is about prevent spreading of deadly disease. Verse 8 and 9. Take care in the case of leprous disease to be very careful to do according to all that the Leviticus priest shall direct you. As I commanded them, so you shall be careful to do so. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way as you came out of Egypt. When someone contracted leprosy, the instructions of the priest Levitical priests must be followed. And we know that in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14, give us the description in detail how God wanted lepers to be examined and quarantined. Why? Because leprosy was such a dreaded disease. God commands here that they take heed in an outbreak of leprosy, to follow the instructions of the priest appointed by God so that it would not become a plague and destroy more life. Leprosy is a sign of what? It's a sign of displeasure or even the curse of God. The instructions from the priest who examine and declare clean or unclean are what? Their instruction? No. It's God's instruction. So obeying the priest is obeying God. In number chapter 12, Miriam led her brother Aaron in a rebellion against Moses. We all know that. God was displeased and struck her with leprosy. Although Moses prayed for Miriam to be healed, God let her be a leper for seven days before healing her. And she was shut out of the camp 
seven days. Now, if someone as important or prominent as Miriam was quarantined as a leper, it shows that every other leper in Israel should also be quarantined. So the law is for disease control. By ring fencing, so called, huh? similar to COVID 19, like lockdown, wearing masks, safe distancing, all this we do to prevent spreading of a deadly disease. So, what is the spiritual principle that we can learn here? We must respect God's ordained authority. What are they? At least in the church, we know the Bible and the church leaders. Sin is deadly. Sin is a deadly disease that all of us carry. And God is displeased. So be kind to yourself and be kind to the church. Listen to God's word. Listen to the counsel of the pastor and be restored through repentance and prayer so that sin can be kept out of the church. Otherwise, we will be kept out of the church. Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 17 tells us to obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? For they are keeping watch over your soul. Souls is very important as those who will have to give an account, not just watch over. They have to report to God, account to God, what happened to these people under their charge, just like the priest. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. In other words, you will be disadvantaged if you do not listen to the counsel of the pastor. The fourth law is to preserve human dignity. Verses 10 to 13. Again, the lender is the master to the borrower. But look at these verses. You see, the house is the refuge and fortress of the borrower. It is protected by law. All of us have a house. The lender should not humiliate the borrower. How? By batching into the house of the borrower to collect the loan. And anything the borrower has pledged, for example, the house or maybe the bed or even clothing, the lender must allow the borrower to use them at night so that he can sleep in his own house in a dignified way sleeping on his own bed and in his own clothes. So the spiritual principle for us is this. Do to others what you wish them, wish they would do to you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Jesus says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And that is serious. We must do that. As we desire our dignity be preserved, we should do the same to others. God is pleased when we have a heart for the underdog and spare them the humiliations of being a borrower. That is kindness. The fifth law is about upholding justice. This law exposes the guilt of oppressive employer who overloading their workers with work, giving excessive and unreasonable scolding withholding or delaying wages to the poor 
workers, verse 14 and 15. And also the practice of unfair punishment, such as making the family members to pay for a crime they never committed. In verse 16, parents shall not be punished because of the crime of their children and vice versa. Whoever sin pay not to get involved with the innocent family members. That is injustice. And in verse 17, this law exposed the guilt of bullying the foreigners, the orphans, that is the fatherless, and the widow who cannot speak for even for themselves by taking away her clothing as pledge. So the unkind acts of such people run contrary to the will of God, clearly stated in the Bible. Children of God, are to uphold justice and show kindness. Justice and kindness go hand in hand. You look at Michael 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? Two things. To do justice and to love kindness. Justice and kindness go hand in hand. And to walk humbly with God. The sixth law is about providing for the poor and the vulnerable. Verses 19 to 21. We have learned this law before, right? In the book of Deuteronomy. It demands that God's people must purposely, listen carefully, purposely leave some of their harvest for the poor and the needy. For example, in the book of Ruth, we learn that Boaz ordered handful of corn to be left on purpose. For who? For Ruth. Eh? And God bless him. So this law is directing the Israelites to forego their right to keep everything to themselves, give it up, and be generous to the poor and needy, and be a blessing to them in the sight of God. This is a wonderful law. So the spiritual principle for us is this. Don't rationalize. Don't rationalize to claim your right not to leave some for the poor. I know. All of us have this thinking, including myself, right? This is my hard-earned money. This is my reward. Why should I share with you? But look at Proverbs 14.31. It says very clearly, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker. But he who is generous to the needy honors who? Honors God. So do the honor. Don't insult God. The seventh law is about remembrance. If we forget God's kindness, we won't obey God's law of kindness. So verse 18 and 22. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this, referring to all the law just said. In verse 22, it says again, you shall remember that you were a slave, a repeat statement, in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this, obeying all the law. So there are two things here. There are two things to remember. The first is to remember that you were slave. You were the lowest class in the society. 
among the human being you treated. Second thing, remember that God's kindness. If you remember your life as slave, oppressed by the taskmaster in Egypt, you will be able to empathize. Listen, you will be able to empathize with the poor and vulnerable in your midst. Is that true? If you remember God's kindness in redeeming you unconditionally from slavery, you will be able to show kindness to others unconditionally. Isn't that true? So in the same manner, after Jesus has redeemed us from sin that enslaved us, our lives will be filled with kindness. Look at John 7, 38. This is what Jesus said. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He is talking about the life-saving spirit overflowing to bless people around us. Like this cup. Like this coffee cup. During the retreat. In the cafe. I took this picture because it looks like inviting me to take a seat. I suddenly take notice of that because it's really going, going to, going to uh, uh, flow out of the cup. Take a sip. Vincent, take a sip. Refresh your tired and thirsty soul. Now, of course, the coffee smell is really nice. Huh? Now, if we believe in Jesus, he said he will pour into our soul and make it pure. And build beautiful and beautiful and make it pure and beautiful and fill our hearts to the brim with his kindness. Apostle Paul in our uh, in Galatians 5 22 23 not 23 24 huh? 22 23 in our responsive reading talk about the fruit of the spirit I want us to notice that kindness is in the middle, in the middle of the nine, uh, in the fruit of the spirit. Isn't that very interesting? So I thought about it. Wow. We need a kind heart to be able to love. Love is an action word. We need a kind heart to have joy and peace and be patient. We need a kind heart to display goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and finally, self-control. All come from the kindness of God. God told the Israelites to be kind to people because of what happened to them in the past. Don't forget. God also tell us to be kind to people because of what Jesus had done for us in the past. We have a God who showed us his empathy, his generosity, and loving us unconditionally. That is our God. We should and we can do the same. Empathy isn't just about feeling sorry for someone. Empathy is about stepping into others' shoes and feeling their emotion. God knows our feelings, our desperation. God knows our aspiration. God genuinely feels for us and act on it by sacrificing His Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from hell, unconditionally. This is generosity of the highest degree. Generosity is not just about giving money or material possession, but also about sharing time, knowledge, skill, taking pleasure in helping others and expect nothing in return. 
That is generosity. Generosity is not about grand gesture. Sometimes the smallest act of kindness can make the biggest difference. Don't you think so? Whether it's helping a stranger crossing the road safely, helping the elderly is carrying their grocery, or spending a morning volunteering, or simply being there for a friend in need. Just be there. Don't even have to say a word. These acts of generosity will go a long way to bless those in need. In the heart of a kind soul lies an immeasurable capacity for love. Love deeply and unconditionally without expectation or condition. A love that extended to strangers, to animals, and even to nature. It is a kindness that truly makes the soul shine. If there are more kind people like this in this world, I'm sure you agree with me, this world will not only be a happier place, it will glow you will glow with God's glory. So in conclusion, the overarching principle of today's sermon, listen carefully, is to remember that we were oppressed by the slavery of sin, unable to set ourselves free. Yet God has shown us His kindness so that we may show kindness to others. In so doing, people around us will be able to see the kindness of Jesus. So today, I want to present to you the truth for life. For a long time, I have not put it in this way. Our kindness is born out of the kindness of Jesus. Our kindness is born out of the kindness of Jesus. In other words, you have to encounter Jesus if you want to be a kind person, to be a blessing to the people, your family, and the society. Practice Jesus' kindness, and people around us will be attracted to Jesus, not to ourselves. So, this is for the application. How about we all do this today? Starting from today, set a goal of noticing. Number one, re recording. So that you not forget. Uh. Recording and remembering God's kindness in your life. For what? To share and to show God's kindness. For what? To encourage other people application for today. Let's spend a minute to do some reflection. Thank God for His kindness. I think that must first come out in our reflection. His kindness has shown to you through Jesus. And humbly ask God to fill your heart with empathy, generosity, and love. For one another. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are kind God. Without your kindness, we won't be here today. We know the Lord that you love us deeply. You love us sacrificially, unconditionally. You're kind to us. How can we not be kind to others? So, O oh Lord, we owe you kindness. Sometimes, Lord, we even are unkind to ourselves. We don't know why. But surely, Lord, that you understand us and you know. And we ask today, the Lord, that you will cause us, open our eyes and open our hearts to the truth that you have shown us in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. Went to the cross, Lord, for us and never expect anything. Oh Lord, we ought to repent. We repent for our unkindness toward ourselves. 
towards others, towards our family members, towards our spouse, towards the people around us. These are all unacceptable. So forgive us, Lord. And grant us, Lord, the wisdom. Grant us, Lord, the grace to know, dear Lord, that it is not a good thing for us as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ to behave in such a way. May you feel us, Lord. Feel us. Feel our life with your kindness. In Jesus' name we pray.